Today we will be talking about a nervous system. We're going to start with the functions, the structure, then we will continue with the different parts and main cells that comprise the nervous system. Functionally, it is a major communication and integration system of the body. It controls the um, actions, conscious or automatic actions. It communicates within the body from one end of the body to another. It collects and integrates the stimuli, whether internal or external. And based on these stimuli, nervous system formulates the appropriate responses. Unlike in case for um, endocrine system, the responses of nervous system are immediate. Uh, endocrine system is another system that controls body responses. And um, the responses of endocrine system are more delayed and more uh, long living. So structurally, there are two parts of the nervous system. Central, which consists of brain and spinal cord and peripheral nervous system which consists of peripheral nerves and various sensory receptors central nervous system is protected by the vertebral column for the spinal cord and cranial cavity but in skull for the brain so essentially axial skeleton a huge chunk of it protects the central nervous system now, uh, main functions of the central nervous system is to collect and integrate various stimuli. You can see it, the stimuli here and formulate appropriate responses. Now, the function of the peripheral nervous system is to collect the information by the sensory receptors then transfer that information from sensory receptors whether those are somatic receptors receptors of the special senses or autonomic sensory receptors and to transmit this information to the cns once the cns formulated the response the motor neurons somatic or autonomic transmit the responses from the cns to the effectors skeletal muscles smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, or glands. The branch of the nervous system that is collecting the information and transmits the sensory information to the CNS is called afferent division. Once the central nervous system integrates and generates appropriate responses, those motor responses are sent to the effectors via efferent or motor division of peripheral nervous system. So essentially all efferent and afferent neurons as well as all receptors form peripheral nervous system. Sensory receptors can be somatic located in the skin and subcutaneous tissue which will sense things like temperature, touch, pain, position, stretch or contraction of a muscle visceral visceral receptors are located in organs for instance they will sense changes in the chemical composition uh, within the hollow organ or stretch of an organ and they can be special sensory receptors specifically um, sight hearing taste and smell now in terms of the uh, responses the um, motor neurons, neurons that transmit responses from central nervous system to the periphery of the body, can be somatic or autonomic. Somatic division of efferent nervous system regulates the movements that are voluntary, movements that are performed by skeletal muscles. Autonomic division regulates movements that are involuntary. For instance, diameter of blood vessels or activity of the stomach or heart rate. It also will stimulate various glands to produce different secretions. Within the 
autonomic nervous system, there are two subdivisions, sympathetic subdivision and parasympathetic subdivision. The majority of body organs are innervated, are controlled, innervation and control basically, same idea, innervated by both sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. They usually exert opposite effects. If sympathetic system stimulates an organ, parasympathetic will inhibit it. So responses that are governed by sympathetic nervous system deal with fight or flight responses responses during exercise, uh, responses that are necessary when body is active. And these responses are transmitted from the central nervous system to the periphery by the thoracic and lumbar spinal nerves. The parasympathetic nervous system controls responses associated with the conservation of energy and homeostasis, with the relaxation, so-called rest and digest responses. These responses are conveyed by cranial and sacral spinal nerves. Good example of opposite effects uh, of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems on a particular organ would be effects on the heart, while sympathetic nervous system stimulates increases frequency of the cardiac contractions, increases the heart rate, parasympathetic nervous system decreases the heart rate. As you can probably already figure it out, all the effectors for the nervous system can be generally placed into groups, muscles, whether those are skeletal muscles, smooth muscles or cardiac muscles, and glands, exocrine or endocrine glands. So essentially, um, as we mentioned before, skeletal muscles would be the effectors for somatic nervous system, while smooth muscles, cardiac muscles and glands will be the effectors of autonomic nervous system. Let's talk about the cells of the nervous system. There are two types of the cells in the nervous system. It's neurons and neuroglial cells. And neuron is the main functional unit of the nervous system. Uh, neurons can be sensory, can be motor. There are some interneurons. So interneurons, they function is to formulate responses. Sensory neurons carry the sensory information towards the central nervous system. Motor neurons transfer responses from central nervous system to the organs and to the effectors. And interneurons, as you can imagine, uh, will be mostly found in the central nervous system because they do formulate responses. Uh, nerves, as we know them, are basically the arrangement of the um, multiple neurons in a single nerve. So nerves um, consist, uh, sorry, neurons um, consist of the cell body or soma, the dendrites, the axon, and branches of axon form synapses. So dendrites here are receiving parts of the neuron so these dendrites receive the signal from other neuron. Signals, various signals are integrated on the body. And then the resulting signal is transmitted by axon to axonal branches, which form synapses with the next neuron. Usually axons are myelinated. This myelin sheath shown here, this layers of protein myelin separated by the nodes of Rangé. Myelin sheath provides electrical insulation um, to increase the speed of transmission. Uh, for example, uh, in case of autoimmune disease known as multiple sclerosis, immune cells attack myelin sheath and destroy it. That leads to uh, loss of myelination, uh, decreased rate of transmission and various neurological abnormalities. Structurally, neurons can be classified in three categories which are multipolar, bipolar, and unipolar. Multipolar neurons, mostly interneurons and also motor neurons. Um, bipolar neurons, mostly um, 
responsible for um, the special senses picking up the uh, signals from eyes and ears and unipolar is usually uh, responsible for transmitting somatic sensations such as temperature pain or vibration now let's talk about the neuroglial cells so in this image you can see neuroglial cells found in central nervous system astrocytes are responsible for the formation of so-called blood-brain barrier which prevents the transfer of um, unwanted materials from the blood to the brain they also nourish and repair neurons uh, microglial cells phagocytose pathogens destroy pathogens and cellular debris um, oligodendrocytes here uh, provide electrical insulation to the axons of the neurons and the pendulum cells shown here um, responsible for the synthesis production of cerebrospinal fluid which surrounds our brain and cushions it now glial cells in peripheral nervous system are less numerous there are satellite cells that nourish and support the neurons in the periphery they are somewhat analogous to astrocytes and there are schwann cells which are somewhat analogous to oligodendrocytes because they electrically insulate axons and are responsible for the axonal regeneration so let's talk about how neurons are organized and how the um, signals are transmitted and how responses are generated many um, responses of the nervous system are organized by the reflexes so reflexes are responses that are rapid and they respond to a particular sensory stimulus so stimulus right here is sensed by a sensory receptor and then is transmitted by a sensory neuron to the cns usually it does not go through the brain it goes um, into the spinal cord so um, this sensory neuron synapses with interneuron or a motor neuron um, in the spinal cord in this example for instance the uh, sensory neuron synapses with preganglionic motor neuron in the spinal cord um, it can there can can be an interneuron here and then motor neuron transmits the response all the way to the effector in this case will be a smooth muscle so in autonomic reflex arch uh, there is, there are two motor neurons like shown in this picture pre and post ganglionic uh, and in somatic reflex arch it's just one long motor neuron as we mentioned before somatic effectors are skeletal muscles while autonomic effectors are cardiac and smooth muscles and glands now we're going to talk a little bit about electrophysiology of the central nervous system uh, we need to first describe what the channels are and why they need it so we mentioned before that cell membrane has the hydrophobic center uh, meaning that hydrophilic substances like various ions cannot diffuse through the cell membrane therefore they must use channels channel proteins there are four categories of channels uh, leaky channels shown here they just let the ions to get through uh, voltage gated channels shown in this picture where changes in the membrane potential um, open and close the channel mechanically gated channels which respond to various um, distortions let's put it this way uh, of the membrane shape uh, various mechanical stimulus can can open and close mechanically gated channels and finally ligand gated or chemically gated channels which can be opened and closed by via interaction with the various chemicals like this acetylcholine for example opens this um, sodium potassium uh, calcium sodium channel 
Now, uh, let's define what the membrane potential is. So membrane potential, a resting membrane potential, is the difference in the concentrations of ions between the two sides of the cell membrane. The outer side of the cell membrane is positive, and the inner side of the cell membrane is negative. So usually, uh, during the normal transmission, during a typical nerve impulse, the membrane potential of a neuron changes between negative 70 millivolts and plus 30 millivolts. So as we mentioned at rest, um, the inner side is always negative. That's where we measure it. Therefore, negative 70 millivolts. And um, the changes in the charge, changes in the ion concentration across the cell membrane, is what generates the signal that goes through the um, axon, the action potential. So to understand um, how ions can cross the membrane, we need to explain some aspects. I'm going to go back and talk about the ions that contribute the most to the formation of the membrane potential. It's potassium and sodium. So concentration of potassium is higher inside of the cell. That's a blue ions and concentration of sodium is higher outside of the cell. Um, so neither sodium nor potassium can close the, uh, cross the membrane directly. In order to cross the membrane, they need to use the ion channels. Okay. They can, if they diffuse going from the high concentration to low concentration, they use transmembrane proteins called channels. If they, for some reason, will have to go against the concentration gradient from low concentration to high concentration, they will have to use the transmembrane protein known as the pump. Now, let's talk a little bit about how graded potential is, um, is formed. So graded potential is a local hyperpolarization or depolarization of neural membranes. What does that mean? Here on this graph, you see membrane potential bit being at negative 70 millivolts. If a positively charged ion, for, for example, sodium, will start to diffuse into the cell, it will make the membrane potential inside of the cell a little bit more positive. We call it depolarization. If a negatively charged ion, let's say chloride, will start to diffuse into the cell, or positively charged ion, let's say potassium, will start to diffuse out of the cell, it will make the membrane potential a little bit negative, and we call it hyperpolarization. So depolarization of a neuron is called excitatory postsynaptic potential. You can see various excitatory postsynaptic potentials here. Hyperpolarization of the neuron is called inhibitory postsynaptic potential. It makes neuron more negative. Now, um, when graded potential crosses a particular threshold, shown here, it becomes an action potential. Action potential is essentially a self-sustained change in the membrane potential spreading along the axon. It's a nerve signal. Interestingly enough, action potential does not have different values. It works uh, based on all or none principle. It's either there or not. So here's the illustration of the um, action potential propagation across the neuron. So you can see that during the rising, during the peak, sodium channels open, sodium channels open, and here. So when there's a peak coming, sodium channels open and sodium flows uh, across the membrane. Just give it a second, we're gonna see it again. So sodium flows across the membrane, that's 
rising then peak sodium channels close and potassium starts to leave the cell so here's the process of the action potential here that's the resting membrane potential sodium channels open sodium starts to flow into the cell causing depolarization making it more positive then at the peak of depolarization sodium channels close potassium channels open and that leads to repolarization of the neuron returning back to normal membrane potential however since potassium channels are slow they remain open even when cell reaches its resting membrane potential which leads to hyperpolarization eventually sodium potassium pump will restore the resting membrane potential and cell will return to its normal membrane potential now this is another illustration of how it works so at rest sodium channels are closed potassium channels are closed and during depolarization phase sodium channels are open while potassium channels are still closed and the membrane potential starts to rise so cell becomes more positive excited then at the peak sodium channels close potassium channels open and potassium starts to flow out of the cell uh, it's a bit simplified picture here but eventually uh, cell repolarizes and both channels close cell returns to square one and another action potential can be propagated through that particular part of the membrane now we mentioned the word synapse before so the synapse is basically a space which separates two neurons one neuron from another synapse is the place where two cells interact without direct contact at the synapse one neuron so-called presynaptic neuron releases a chemical called neurotransmitter and that neurotransmitter then diffuses through the synaptic cleft and binds to the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron causing a change of membrane potential and action potential in the postsynaptic neuron so look what happens at this during the synaptic transmission the action potential here arrives at the presynaptic neuron causes the release of neurotransmitter neurotransmitter binds to the receptors on the post synaptic neuron and generates another action potential and the signal keeps being propagated now let's talk about the anatomy of the brain uh, brain can be you know described in several parts but cerebrum um, diencephalon right about here cerebellum and the brain stem the function of cerebrum is to consciously control the um, movements it's a memory organ it's responsible for learning personality and so on the encephalon its function is relay of information and regulation of various visceral activities cerebellum uh, provides higher control of voluntary muscle skeletal muscle movements and brain stem also regulates various visceral activities the volume of the brain is about uh, 1.3 liters and the mass is about 1.4 kilograms now brain is protected by cerebrospinal fluid and meninges so there are three meninges dura matter arachnoid matter and pia matter the outermost layer dura matter uh, has two sub layers um, the connective tissue part that attaches to the skull is called pure steel layer and um, the part that attaches to the um, kind of separates sometimes it's called meningeal layer when they separate they form venous sinuses so outermost um, dura matter is separated by subdural space from a thin arachnoid matter which forms this web-like projections therefore arachnoid matter um, and those projections extend into 
subarachnoid space that separates arachnoid matter and pia matter. Subarachnoid space uh, contains blood vessels that supply the brain. It is also a place where um, uh, cerebrospinal fluid circulates. Now, cerebrospinal fluid uh, constantly is produced in um, ventricles in the brain, so-called choroid plexuses, and it is drained into the uh, back into the blood via arachnoid villi, right here. If these blood vessels that are found in subarachnoid space are damaged, it may lead to the bleeding, causing subarachnoid hematoma. If these blood vessels are damaged, it may lead to subdural hematoma. Inflammation of the meninges is known as meningitis. It's a very serious disease that often can be lethal. Cerebrospinal fluid here circulates around the brain and around the spinal cord, providing cushioning to the brain. It basically floats the brain. As we mentioned before, it is produced in the choroid plexuses in the ventricles. There are four ventricles, two lateral ventricles, shown here a third ventricle and a fourth ventricle here. Ventricles are connected by foramina and cerebral aqueduct. Now, uh, this cerebrospinal fluid helps to isolate the brain from the blood, maintaining blood-brain barrier. Uh, now, when uh, cerebrospinal fluid, since it's produced at about uh, 500 milliliters a day, the total volume of cerebrospinal fluid at any given moment is about 150 milliliters which means it has to be drained all the time. It drains into the blood by arachnoid villi. Obstruction of arachnoid villi may lead to accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid around the brain in the condition known as hydrocephalus, which is treatable. Um, surgeons will install a special drainage that will remove excessive cerebrospinal fluid. Now, um, we're going to start from the bottom. We're going to start our conversation about different parts from the brain stem, brain stem has three parts, midbrain right here, pons, and medulla oblongata. The main function of the midbrain is to control startle and visual reflexes, regulates pain, and provides a communication between the cerebrum and the motor cortex. A pons contains respiratory center, and also provides the communication between the motor cortex and cerebellum. And finally, medulla oblongata is responsible for a variety of visceral functions, such as respiratory, cardiovascular, and digestive, for various autonomic reflexes, such as vomiting, swallowing, or sneezing. It also delivers somatic sensations to the cerebellum. Now, cerebellum is one of the chief controllers of the fine muscle movements maintains posture, balance, and muscle tone, uh, refines the movement patterns, makes the movements precise. It is important in a learning motor skills such as riding a bike. It requires a lot of sensory input, such as visual input, proper reception, position of the body in space, and vestibular input, the body's balance. Damage to the cerebellum will lead to clumsiness. Diencephalon, here the part in the center, which consists of the hypothalamus and thalamus, and a small portion right about here, epithalamus, uh, is important in relaying, first of all, sensory information to the proper part of the, the cortex. Um, thalamus essentially directs the sensory inputs to various cortical regions for the analysis and for generation of the appropriate responses. Hypothalamus controls endocrine system. It also controls a variety of um, autonomic uh, functions such as body temperature, uh, appetite, um, day-night cycle called circadian rhythm, physiological responses to emotions, how we physiologically respond to fear or uh, with elevated heart rate, 
or controls our sexual arousal. Hypothalamus is also instrumental in uh, formation of memories. Epithalamus is a small portion. It produces melatonin, the hormone that helps to control the sleep cycle, the circadian rhythm. Now, cerebrum is the largest portion of the brain. Um, it is our main processing center, responsible for learning, memory, and planning. Uh, it processes and integrates the information and um, generates the appropriate responses. There are four lobes. Frontal, shown here in red. Preetal, shown here in blue. Occipital, shown here in green. And temporal, shown here in yellow. The surface of the brain is covered in creases called sulci and elevated areas called gyri. This folds on the surface of the brain uh, provide increased surface area which allows the brain to accommodate more neurons. The outermost layer of the cerebrum is called cerebral cortex. It is a gray matter. It contains neuronal bodies, dendrites, various non-myelinated axons, and it is responsible for um, thinking, analysis, memory, control of voluntary movements, um, conscious sensations, and so on and so forth. Uh, the inner layer is white matter, myelinated axons, and it's responsible for communication between the different parts of the cortex. Myelin provides an electrical insulation to axons and uh, allows the faster impulse transmission. The formations of white matter that connect to different parts of the cerebrum are called tracts. Now, um, hemispheres, left and right hemispheres, are um, slightly distinct. So, for instance, right hemisphere mostly controls the analysis of the sensory inputs, spatial relationships and facial recognition, while the left hemisphere is mostly responsible for uh, interpretation of language and speech, writing, speaking, logical decisions, and so on and so forth. However, each hemisphere can perform all the functions. So, although there is a distribution between the hemispheres, in hypothetical case, if one doesn't work, another one can take over doesn't really happen. So cortex has um, distinct cortices, um, sensory, motor, and association cortices. So motor areas are responsible for the control of movements, voluntary motor commands, have this primary and premotor area. Um, association areas there are three of them. Anterior. Let's go back to motor, actually. We have motor uh, and premotor areas which control skeletal muscle movements. Broca's speech area controls muscles that move lips and tongue. And frontal eye field area controls the muscles that move the eyes. Um, association areas are responsible for higher uh, processing. Anterior association area, also known as prefrontal cortex, is responsible for our personality, learning, uh, organizational skills, um, conscious controls of emotions. Posterior association area, which is located somewhere about here, um, is responsible for recognition of speech. And then there's limbic association area, which is kind of diffuse uh, throughout the brain. Uh, limbic association area is responsible for our appreciation of emotions. Uh, now, sensory cortices include somatosensory cortex, uh, which is responsible for integration of somatic inputs, somatic sensations such as touch, pain, or vibration. Visual cortices are responsible for um, understanding and recognition of the visual inputs. Auditory cortices, responsible for um, auditory inputs, and olfactory cortices, responsible for 
inputs of smell. There are also gustatory areas, taste, and uh, one that is not shown here is visceral uh, sensory area, which is responsible for um, sensations from the organs. So you need to um, know where um, the corresponding areas are located. For instance, somatosensory is in the parietal lobe, visual is in the occipital, auditory is in the temporal, motor cortex is, and, and prefrontal cortex are in a, in a frontal lobe. Lastly, let talk about, let's talk about a memory. So, um, memory is formed by the exposure to the environment. And actually, a stressful environment reduces the uh, ability of the brain to learn to memorize. So, memory may be categorized based on longevity, uh, the immediate memory, okay, then short term memory, some of which we forget, obviously, based on the short term memory, we form long term memory. Some of the long term memory information becomes irretrievable. And some is and some is permanently lost. Based on the uh, functional differences, memory can be procedural and declarative. So declarative memory, which heavily involves an organ called hippocampus, is a memory um, like uh, memorizing the class roster or memorizing a verse. Well, the procedural memory deals with the memorization of motor skills and heavily involves structures like basal nuclei, premotor cortex, uh, riding a bike, for instance, or uh, driving a car. The procedural memory is really hard to forget. You cannot forget how to ride a bike or how to drive a car. So that will conclude our conversation about the nervous system. In the next lecture, we will talk about the senses, special senses.